My talk title is using Dre tables. That's the Python package name. We're actually calling it that uh, to make presentation tables, presentable tables in Python. So presentable is kind of an important distinction because tables can mean lots of things to different people, especially uh, people in computers. It can just be like data tables, tables and databases. But we're actually talking about the tables you see on this screen here, like, you know, in this sort of angled, but you, you kind of see where we're going. Like tables you see in a publication, you see on, on the internet, um, you know, like in The Economist, tables like that. That's where I'm, that's where I'm going. Uh, so let's talk about great tables and in context with another package called GT. I worked on that for a long time, still work on it, and, and just tables in general. Um, so yeah, we actually started this whole journey way back with another table package for R. It's called GT. Um, if you can believe this, if I can believe it, it was back in 2018, and it's still under active development. Again, not a joke, in 2024. Uh, so ask me about this later during Q&A. Like, why I'm working on table packages for this long. Okay. Okay. But hang on. We don't want to ignore Python. It, it's, you know, it's kind of important. People use it in data science. So enter grade tables. It's basically a GT for Python. Okay. So I may have an initiative in posit to, to be doing more Python because that's a pretty addressable crowd. So that's where we're at here. So um, inevitably the next few years we'll be focused on both grade tables and GT. Okay. So why do we even do this? Uh, why spend so much time on tables? Well, we love tables. I'm not of the opinion that they're dull and drab. It, quite the opposite. They're great. And I'll show you why. I'll show you why. Let's actually look at some tables. I, I feel it's disappointing to like talk about tables and not show the tables because that's like really the, the thing. And again, sports analytics, uh, that was like the last talk here at this workshop. Um, and here's some sports analytics tables taken right from, from the internet, from Twitter, actually. Uh, Andrew Weatherman makes these wonderful tables using GT and also GT Extras, which is an add-on package. And uh, they're fantastic. They, they delight people all the time in, in Twitter. People comment on them, you know, widely shared. And some of the good things, when I look at tables, I sort of dissect them a little bit. I see here, oh yes, we have a title and a subtitle. Good stuff, we want that. A spanner, that's great. Now we, now we have these things sort of like grouped together. Wonderful. Highlighting. I mean, that draws your eye, right? You know, Indiana, that's the thing we're looking at. Uh, graphics. Wonderful. We can do that. We have the technology. We can totally do that. And I think it's great. It adds to the table as a visualization, as something that's not dull and drab. Here's another one by the same person. The person's quite prolific, I might add. Um, but look, bar charts in the table. I mean, charts are not just for plots. They, they can be in a table. Like, why not? Uh, and groups of rows. This is actually super important. We can sort of like break things down and make it much easier for the for the reader to to digest this information. There's lots of information here, but people love precise values that are formatted well. And like bar charts, it can still it still guides the eye. They're like it's a perfect cross between like a table and a plot type visualization. One more thing, footnotes. Love that. You can you can have more information just throw in the footer. And uh, some of these terms are pretty complex, like poor pack. I don't know what that is, but the photo takes care of that. So wonderful. One more table I want to show you, getting away from sports analytics. is this one right here on uh, CO2 intensity. Uh, this one, I believe, is by, uh, oh, I forget who wrote, who made this table. Terrible. I should cite these. But anyways, it's a wonderful table that gets posted all the time, gets updated. And the thing I love about this table is you can it, you know, it's sorted in terms of like CO2 intensity, uh, there's great use of color. We can sort of see here, what is green? What is like this brown color, which is kind of like, you know, kind of bad. <laughs> it's all the coal and the gas. And, and see basically like who's leading on in terms of energy mix, in terms of like CO2 intensity. It's really, really great to see. And this is updated all the time. There's great formatting, wonderful ideas, how we see little things like uh, this 0% is different than this 0% probably because this is a true zero and this is just rounded down. Wonderful little details. And uh, we also have decimal alignment, just overall great stuff, just great balance. And we can sort of see that this table is actually pretty pleasing to look at as well as being very informative. So that's why I like tables a lot. Okay. So way back, uh, I guess early 2018, we, we had some motivation and inspiration for doing table package work. 
So beginning in R, because that's you know, we were R Studio at the time, uh, we wanted to make a table package to serve the R community. But it had to be a bit different and a bit better because there was lots of table packages at that time, and really there still are. So it needed to satisfy a few requirements. Um, big one is have a declarative, easy to use API. So ggplot is a thing, was a thing at the time. You can say it was easy to use. I mean, you didn't have to like get right down to the bare metal and, and specify every little thing. You gave it some instructions and it did the thing you wanted, right? So we wanted to have that as a table API. Uh, we wanted to have the ability to render to different outputs using the same API. This is a bit like dplyr. You could grab a, a local table or a database table, pretty much use the same API. And you know you don't have to learn two APIs for two different types of inputs. So this is the sort of the same thing for outputs. OK, and of course, we wanted to commit to it long term. So yeah, good stuff for me, like job security. Uh, but also like, you know, it's, it's good for the, you know, good for our users, for customers and for the community to have long-term development and maintenance. Um, and we also wanted to stop, stack this package full of features to serve all sorts of table needs. People making tables, they can be simple. They can be super complex as the other examples you saw in the, in the previous slides. Those are what I consider pretty complex tables. Um, and it, it's amazing how many features those tables use from this package. Um, and also, we want to be, be kind of reliable. You can just sort of depend on this table. You, you're basically um, you know, sharing your results. They, they can't be mutilated by a package. So we committed to tons and tons of testing and other quality control measures. OK, great. And uh, you know, before I even started, I did research because you know, I wanted to know what the landscape of like you know, tables was in 2018. And I found this wonderful resource. This is like the only. It's amazing how like tables are taken for granted, and there's like no articles, maybe just blog posts, little snippets here and there, recommendations how many tables. This is an entire manual, 266 pages full of like table. Uh, it, it's basically the Bible for tables, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's called uh, Bureau of the Census Manual of Tabular Presentation, and its subtitle is An Outline of Theory and Practice in the Presentation of Statistical Data in Tables for Replicate Publication. Kind of a mouthful, but this book is amazing, and it's available now. I'm very thankful to the person who made a PDF scan of this book. I, I imagine the original is hard to find because it's an internal publication, but it's an incredible read. Like The recommendations within it are just as vital and valid today as they were way back when. Like there's good ideas in here. And I kind of think tables got dumbed down a little bit, especially in like as electronically and just with, with typewriters. This is more meant for the printing press. Um, but I think we what I used from this book is reviving tons of older ideas. Okay. So this is just one page ripped from the book, essentially the formal table and its major parts right here. So we can see here they they they, uh, they name parts and they decompose them. And uh, this is really just great because otherwise it's really hard to talk about tables. Like, what would you say? Like the, the little cell in the top left corner or the cell that's grouped, you know, this just gives it names, which is super important. So it was a, it definitely a major influence on the design of GT and also it gets carried through to great tables. So yeah, it definitely impressed us, had terminology. It covered all sorts of issues, big and small. And the author dedicated many pages on what not to do as well, sort of like counterexamples when building legible tables. So he would, the author would just like, you know, say, this is good. This is medium good. This is pretty bad, like in pretty much one page and tons of great advice. Even, um, oh, I can just go on and on. So I better, I better get off the topic here. <laughs> but it did at least distill it down to like um, two important guidelines when you're making a table. Use common sense when planning a table, wherever that means to the table author. And uh, this is maybe pretty obvious, but view the table from the standpoint of the user, right? Sort of take a step back. It's like, this table, is this, this makes sense? Would a person just seeing it for the first time know how to read it, like understand all the parts? OK, so good advice. And uh, you know, if you really want to break it down to just one line, uh, you should make tables that, this is a quote, as easy to read and understand as the nature of the material will permit. Will permit. Okay, so some, some you know, basically this is good stuff. Uh, it's easy to overlook when you're making a table, uh, but you really want the table to be easy to parse. Uh, otherwise, you fail step one, which is the whole point of making a table. It's just 
convey information. Great. So we did adapt a lot of the manual's concepts, and I still thumb through the, the PDF and find new little nuggets each, each time I look at it. And uh, they are present all through GT and grade tables. So as I said before, it was strangely hard before to talk about tablet presentation without terminology, without vernacular. Uh, and giving things names really solves so many problems. That terminology is pretty much woven into these packages. So um, because we have this, I think it's actually pretty important and maybe a little bit useful to have a little introduction uh, to what the different table parts are called. So I'll just start from the simple to more complex. So the composition of a table. So the most basic form of a table is cells arranged like a matrix and column labels at the head of each column. Okay. This is pretty intuitive. We all know this, right? Okay. We can add more. We can have something called a table stub. Uh, and basically it just identifies what the rows are, right? And we, we have this all the time. We just don't really call it a table stub, but we intuitively know we want to distinguish the rows from one another. And the top left, um, that's variously called sometimes the top left or the corner left cell. It's just called the stub head because it just sits at the top of the, of the stub and we can give it a stub head label or not up to us. Okay, and uh, another important thing, and we see this all the time in tables, we just didn't really have names for it. We have groups of rows, which could be sorted, they could be arranged and they have labels typically. So we call that a row group and they have row group labels. You can arrange it across so it takes an entire row or you could put it off to the side on, onto the left in, inside the stub. And you can also do cool little things like with indentation as well to sort of like establish the hierarchy. Okay, so rows can be grouped and they can have labels. Uh, another thing we do, and uh, again, we see this all the time, we just don't really talk about it, is summary rows. We can add them to groups, we can add them to the entire table, so they're just, or they could be group-wise summaries. Okay, and we do try to sort of keep them, you know, so we have some demarcation lines so we know what the summary refers to. And of course, we have labels, so we know what the summaries actually mean. Okay, there's more. Uh, so the, the book I was talking about, the manual tether presentation, talks about always having like a table head. Uh, we, we're calling it the table header, and it can have a title and a subtitle. That's definitely something you can do in GT and grade tables, and something we saw in the previous slides. And of course, we can have a footer section, which can contain um, either or of footnotes and source notes. Okay. And they, they serve as really useful annotations. And there's even more. Uh, we can do things like um, use spanner labels to group columns together to establish a hierarchy in the columns. So we call them uh, spanners or spanner labels uh, variously. Great. So that's kind of it. A more complex table. Um, and it's actually really useful because we see it all the time. And once you see it, it's like, well, that's great. <laughs> this is a good table. I can totally understand. I can like look at one section independent of another section, and it's it's easier to read because of all this, uh, you know, architecture. Okay, so that's a, a big segue. I've might have rambled on quite a bit, uh, but let's finally look at grade tables. Um, it's the Python package. So some of its major features thus far is that you can provide either pandas or Polar's data frames as data inputs. So you can use either or. In the R version, it was just basically data frames or tibbles from dplyr. Here it's a bit different because pandas data frames are quite a bit different than polar's data frames, but we're, we're trying to handle both sort of seamlessly. Um, we also have a very simple entry point into the API, which is just the GT class. This mirrors the R API, whereas the GT function. And uh, what we do to, uh, to modify the table is use method chaining to iteratively, iteratively sort of like you know, modify the table and you can quickly iterate through that and see how the table changes. And we have many methods available. So uh, without naming the methods specifically, we have methods to do cell formatting, styling, setting table options, adding parts like you saw on the previous slide, setting column widths, uh, column alignment, you can reorder columns, modify the column labels because they may not be very satisfactory coming from, you know, a table like a data frame. Uh, adding color to the table body uh, in different ways, uh, adding spanner labels, changing the, the padding so it's more compressed, both in the horizontal and also the vertical directions, and also hiding columns from view um, because you may use those columns but may not 
want to show them in the final uh, render. Okay. So we got a few spots on the internet where gray tables is at. You can visit these. Uh, this is not the end of the talk, <laughs> but I just want to say, like, you know, it's it's on the internet. Uh, the GitHub repository for great tables. It's under a new org, not our studio, but posit hyphen dev. That's where we're putting lots of new projects, specifically Python projects, maybe even other projects, but mainly Python projects. So posit dev, great tables. Uh, we have a great website, uh, which is uh, rendered through Quarto Doc, or, sorry, Quarto Doc. And uh, it basically just means that instead of using package down like you would in R, we are you know consuming all the doc strings and other things from from grade tables and rendering it through Quarto. So the Quarto doc project is something that Michael here maintains and works on. Uh, and also PyPI, which is if you don't know Python but you know CRAN, basically that's Python's CRAN, uh, the repository for packages. So it's on there as well. Okay. So we install it with um, pip install great underscore tables, or it could be great hyphen tables. I think both will work. If it's confusing, don't worry about it. Both should work out for you. And let's actually get through some demos. Um, I was a little too afraid to live demo this thing, like I usually do. Uh, but I'm going to do like a sort of like a fake live demo through slides and show you the tables. You're going to just going to slide in, uh, which I think is pretty good. Splits the difference. So as I said before, the entry point is the GT class, capital, capital GT. Uh, we have several included data sets, like islands here. So just like in R we and other Python packages that deal with data, we try to include a bunch of data sets so you can play with the API a little bit. Uh, so we're grabbing that uh, through the import statement we have here. We're just importing islands through our data submodule. We're just taking the first 10 rows. And then, yeah, super simple to get a table, just feed islands mini to GT. And let's show the table. There we are. And I have a little tip. Use Quarter for this because it renders beautifully. Um, you can use like things like VS Code, um, like the uh, like the notebook view. Not nearly as good as this. It's kind of like a, a thing to work on that for us, but it looks really beautiful in Quarter. Okay, next table. Um, so we do a, we do a thing like we chain a bunch of methods together. So this is more advanced. So in this case, what we're doing is we're taking islands mini as before. In this case, we're creating a stub by saying that this column name, it has row labels. So we're just going to declare in the argument row name call the column that contains the labels for the rows. Then it'll move it to the left side, and then it'll set off to be a stub. OK. And then the second thing we're doing is uh, we're adding a header. So basically, a title and a subtitle. We just provide text. It'll do the thing. And then two different source notes. And the cool thing with source notes is you can use, well, basically with any text you provide, you can use MD, the function. We have to import that. Uh, but if you use that, it'll um, it'll render markdown text. But here we have italics. It'll just render that as italics in the end. OK, so let's take a look at this table. Ta-da, there it is. So very nice. Like It didn't take that much. A lot of this was just text. You just had to declare we needed a header. We needed two source notes. The order doesn't really matter, except for the source notes, because they're two of the same thing. The order you put them in is the order they appear. But you can have tab header much after. Because the idea is we just provide instructions to GT, and then during the render phase, it'll just carry them out in sort of like independently. OK, even further. So we're going to add even more to that. Uh, in the last example, we ended off here. Uh, but we're going to do more things. We're going to add the stub head label, top left corner, that cell. Just call it landmass name just to give a little something instead of nothing. And then we can do things with uh, these formatting methods, like format uh, values inside the cells. So we have a bunch of these. Um, one we're using here because we just have uh, essentially like uh, uh, miles, or sorry, uh, square miles. We're going to take that value. We know it's in like thousands of square miles. So we're going to scale it by 1,000 to bring it back to the you know actual value. We're, we're, we're going to focus it on the column, which is size, which contains those values. And we use another argument here called compact. What it'll do is it'll bring those values into like a compact representation. OK, we'll see. You'll know it when you see it. And then what we're doing is we're changing the column label of um, size to something you know a bit more informational, size in square miles. And we'll have a line break there because we're using HTML. That's another helper function. And then we're changing the widths of columns. So we have this. this uh, uh, this little dictionary here, and we can just specify the widths in, in pixels here for these different columns. 
so we can sort of like adjust fine tuning the table. And here we go. So this is what I'm talking about in the compact representation. It works really well in English, um, uh, but not so well for other languages that don't use these suffixes, but it's pretty good for that. So size and square miles, we can sort of see the line break is there and we have the widths nicely chosen. Otherwise the width will just be sort of like determined by the content, um, whatever is the widest, that's what the width will be. Uh, but we have complete control over little things like that. Great. So let's get to just one or two complex examples. This is not really a workshop, so I just want to show you what's possible. Um, we're taking here in this example, a Polar's data frame. And as before, uh, Pandas as well as Polar's is fully supporting gray tables. And uh, what we'll do is we'll import air quality, which is actually a Pandas data frame. Uh, but we're going to convert that to a Polar's one. Uh, so basically just this, I, I'm missing an import statement, which is importing Polar's. Sorry about that. Uh, but if you had that, this would work. Polars from pandas, take that, make that a Polars data frame. And then we'll just like prove that it works by passing that to the GT class. And as you can sort of see, like it's kind of like it does render a bit different. Um, we have some missing values. You, you sort of see them as none. Okay, so you can distinguish what the missing values are. Okay, great. So we can do some really, really cool stuff um, with Polars expressions. Um, so basically what we're doing here is we're doing some styling. We're taking an expression here. We're saying that this is a case when expression in polars, sort of a PL. So when the temperature in the column is greater than 70, okay, we're going to say the color should be light yellow. Otherwise it should be light blue. These are just strings. But once we put that into that expression right here in the color argument of style fill within tab style, it's kind of nested here. But if you follow this, it's pretty cool. Then we will get the, the, the appropriate thing. In the column, which is the column temperature, this will be honored. This expression will work. OK, so let's take a look. So pretty cool. It does exactly what we asked for. Any temperatures in here that are above 70 are a light yellow. Anything, anything else is essentially like light blue. So we can take that pretty far. We can make pretty complex expressions. As long as you understand like how the expression syntax or uh, API works in, in polars, then, then you're good. You can do pretty wild things. And you know where to plug it in, essentially. OK, so I just want to give you status, because Great Tables is a bit of a young project. Uh, we really started getting going on this like seriously, uh, probably like late last year. I think it was like, I don't quite remember the month. I think it was November. I recall November being sort of like when we started to go full bore on this. Uh, so what we've done so far is quite a few things. I'm going to break it down uh, one by one. We have a pretty wide range of formatting methods. So we have things like format number, format integer, format scientific, uh, just different ways to render numbers into different representations. So each of these methods has a sort of like optimized interface for dealing with the task at hand, whether it be integers, numbers, dates and times. Uh, it's kind of covered. So. And you don't have to remember little things like format strings. That's kind of like arcane. We wanted to have things in little methods which are meant for the thing you're doing. Uh, we have the data color method, which lets you colorize cells by data values. Just using this one method once, defining a few rules, and letting it run over all the different uh, columns in the table allows you to do things like this. So you can define a palette. Uh, you can define uh, a palette name. We have a few presets in there. And uh, some of the things we're doing in the future is letting you, to, letting you describe uh, palette functions, essentially, so you can just like you know customize this even more. Uh, we have ways to style specific cells with the tab style method, along with other uh, classes like style and look. You can sort of narrow in to different cells or groups of cells and apply specific styles. Like here, we've done the thing of uh, applying a background color, uh, changing the text to small caps, and here, what we're doing is combined with an expression, we are calling rows differently depending on some value. Oh, wrong way. There we are. OK. Uh, also, the basic stuff we have covered, like tab header, just for adding the title and the subtitle, uh, and adding source notes with tab source notes. Again, there's two examples of that. Really super simple, but if you don't have it, it's kind of like you know, you're missing something in your tables, I think. 
Um, and as we've seen in one example before, uh, we can modify column widths very finely with calls width. Uh, we can use pixel values or percentage values, any mix thereof we can use. And we can change column labels. And again, you can use markdown to make the column labels formatted nicely in terms of bold text, italics text, what have you. And we've done much more, and we continue to do more things as we roll up releases pretty quickly. Uh, tab options is a new thing we have. It lets you set options globally. It's kind of like a very monstrous method in that there's lots of options, but pretty much anything you need will be in there for the table. Um, we included lots of data sets in the data set module. Um, we have formatting met methods available as functions in the val submodule in case you want to just use these formatters on a list independent of tables, you kind of still have that. So you can sort of use it outside of tables. Uh, right now we, we are focused on HTML rendering uh, for notebook and Quora output. So we have that pretty much down. And we got a really sweet Quora doc site for the guides, API reference, and for our internal blog posts as well. Next up, uh, basically do the rest <laughs> uh, to get up to speed to uh, get up to parity with GT and, and beyond. So it, but we're tackling that in some order. This is not the order, but these are just some of the temple features we want to put in. Uh, ability to put in footnotes, uh, summary row support, uh, merging cell data together across columns, uh, which is kind of a big one. It's kind of complicated, but it's kind of nice to format things separately and then bring them all together in a sort of a one unified way in, into one column. Uh, we want to have things like unit notation support. So you can have, say, for instance, in uh, Column labels, you can in include some measurement units, which are seen often in tables. It's kind of like a, you know, a normal thing. And then also like units uh, just you know, within the body of the table as well. We want to support something called nanoplots. We already have that in the R version. It's little interactive plots, which I call both useful and fun because you can sort of play with them a little bit. Uh, and plots are great, as we see in, in the example tables. We need to have some, some native way just to insert plots because um, it's very informative. Uh, we want the ability to export GT tables as images. That's how those other tables were shared as images. We eventually want to get LaTeX. And I don't know if you heard of this, Typed support. It's kind of like the contender for LaTeX. It's coming in late, but you know maybe it'll supplant or hopefully take some market share away from LaTeX. I'm not sure how you feel about LaTeX, but it's kind of what I'm feeling. Uh, so Typed, that's a new thing uh, for typesetting documents in, in PDFs and wherever else. Um, and we also want the ability to add new rows and columns to a GT table. That's a thing we have in the R version as well. Seemed like a, a bad idea a long time ago, but it's increasingly a better idea these days just to like, you know, add some stuff to a table as you as you feel the need is there. And interactive tables with pagination, filtering, and sorting controls. That's kind of the sort of thing you see everywhere. Just a just a bunch of records, and you got lots of them, you want to filter them, page through them. Uh, we want to have that as well, because we want to solve all sorts of problems with tables. And a lot more beyond that. There's just a lot to do, which is great. That's kind of it. That's where we're at with great tables. Um, again, young, but good. It's promising. We're going to keep working on it, and it'll be just as good. You'll be able to produce those tables that you saw in those early examples um, with great tables in no time. And that's that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, I'll stop recording.